three, two, one, all the way from SoCal, Fritz Rodriguez. Hey, uh, how's everything there, bro? How's everything there? Good evening, guys. Um, everything is good. Uh, what an honor it is to be part of your your podcast. Mm. And I'm looking forward to sharing. <laughs> more than anything this is bound to happen uh, because of everything that I'm trying to to build and puzzle together and as much as possible those who are going to watch this and, and listen to the audio version will have a better understanding and a better glimpse of how was the martial arts scene what were the events that needed to happen in order to mold the MMA and the BJJ scene as we see it today. So my jump off point for you, Fritz, uh, your martial arts journey, like how, what was your first, like first introduction to martial arts? And uh, I mean, as far as you can come, how, as far as you can remember, how did it all began? Oh, well, um, my parents always used to push me when I was young. I was kind of an inactive kid mm -hmm. growing up and, um, so my parents took me to Taekwondo mm. when I was like seven or eight, but I didn't like it. I didn't like getting hurt. So I, after like maybe a couple of years of trying to convince my parents, I finally they made me quit. <laughs> but then um, later on, later on, uh, I've always found myself getting in situations where I didn't have the confidence to defend myself. So. I was looking for some way to be able to um, overcome those insecurities and martial arts for me was the best outlet that I could have um, put myself into. Mm -hmm. So um, during, this is like what, 1993, 94, I was looking, I was always a big fan of Bruce Lee and all that, like everyone mm -hmm. else. Um, Squadron Shop, Vera Mall was, really near my place so I'd mm -hmm. go there and check out the videos and all that I was looking into what martial arts I could get into at that time the closest I could get was there's some um, Aikido mm. combat Aikido Yao Yan I didn't really like the striking arts in um, 1994 95 I was visiting my uncle in New York and he introduced me to the ultimate fighting championships Mm -hmm. And everyone knows during that time, Hoyce Gracie and all that, you know, changed, you know, changed the martial arts scene. Uh, and then when I was in high school, I had these two crazy classmates who would always talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. I think the Philippine martial arts uh, community are familiar with these two guys, Robert San Diego and Erwin Tagle. Mm -hmm. They were my classmates in the senior year of high school and they just kept on messing around in class and somehow sparked my interest. We'd talk about um, legends in the Filipino uh, martial arts or fight scene. Mm -hmm. Legends like uh, uh, Alvin Aguilar, you know, they were big, mm -hmm. big names back then and they were in college, we were in high school. Mm. Alvin Aguilar, Joel Yaptenchai, <laughs> Miguel Zubiri. Yeah. We'd see them out in uh, San Mig and Mars, and we'd be like me, Erwin, Robert, like, oh, yan si ganyan, yan si idol, oh, yan. <laughs> like little kids, like, peeking through, you know, like, oh, yan si, si Alvin Aguilar. He's like this, like that. He trains with Hoyce Gracie. Like, wow. <laughs> okay, so this was at the time that, I know, Alvin was with Hoyce na. Okay. Yeah, Alvin, I, we heard, uh, rumor had it, that he trained with Hoyce Gracie. Mm. And yeah, he was a badass. Those, those guys. <laughs> the, the, the guys from the south, and then there's Villa Campa in the north. And yeah, those guys were the ones that we were like, oh, we, we wish we could be like them when we grew up. <laughs> and then um, in 97... I was always wondering where this Hoist Gracie, where where he worked, where this guy trained. I, I was always thinking he was in some sort of 
uh, remote place here in the United States. Mm-hmm. Little did I know he, his gym, Gracie Academy with Horion was maybe like not more than 10 minutes away from where my uncle lived in Torrance. So <laughs> one day I was passing by, I saw it, yeah, I saw the sign. I was like, wow. I came back and I started training. That's okay. 1997. Never looked back since, man. <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes away long pala. It was just, you know, it, it was a 10, 10 minute drive. Away, yeah. yeah. And then from there, so then the, the, the knack and the, then that's where you started training jujitsu. And then was this like you're shuttling between Philippines and or about like Philippines states? Um, <clears throat> when did did you go like do a formal training in the Philippines where you were here? I trained with um, first I started Sarian when mm-hmm. I was in um, La Salle. I found um, Alvin Lee and Alvin Aguilar, Joel Yapin, Chai, those guys. I was able to um, hook up with them and we started doing informal, a uh, lot of, lot of uh, Jeet Kune Do concepts and then Alvin mm-hmm. would show up. They At first, they wouldn't teach me grappling. That's for the boys, Young Dao, Secret mm-hmm. Milan. You know, they didn't <laughs> want it. So that's when I went to the Gracie Academy to train. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then afterwards, I don't know, like, then what, was there like a time where in there was a grappling class and then then they were still grappling? Or how? No, how? They, 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 everyone knew that uh, I, I kind of told everyone, hey, I'm going to go to the academy. I asked Alvin, mm-hmm. what, how is it like? You mm-hmm. know, and he was like, okay. And we were not really that close before. He was, uh, he saw me as like, Psh, you know, tong batang to na, the training to Gracie, probably like uh-huh. that, you know. Uh-huh. And um, so I went over there and I trained and then came back here. I, I took a two-week intensive training course um, in the Gracie Academy mm-hmm. uh, one summer, one summer, and uh, uh, went back, went back and um, shared here and there what I learned. Mm-hmm. And, and then afterwards, was the the. the Siyempre, sarian days, that was like college na eh, di ba? College days na, na nagsarian ka. Mm-hmm. Di ba? And then, how was, how was the experience of training there and the difference between, and how it did it progress? Kasi, this is something that's been unfolding through even the other conversations I had with, yan, sila Sixto, sila, sila Alvin, sila Pichon, and I've always asked, uh, I've all, I, I, I always end up asking these questions. Like for you, uh, how would you answer it? How would you answer this question? Like, how were you able to sustain the interest and the momentum of training given na jujitsu wasn't really popular? Jujitsu was practically unknown back then, diba? So, how were you able to sustain and maintain your interest? Like, what drove you to keep training? You know, what what motivated you to? to learn this given that there was limited information? Well, our motivation back then, my motivation at least, was just to be the toughest guy in, in Mars and San Mig. You know? <laughs> that was just my motivation then. That's the real reason why I probably got, you know, stuck to the sport. Of course, and hanging out with the right, you know, like the, the cool kids, mm-hmm. you know, once we got to train, once I got to train, these guys were the cool kids. Uh, when I was in in high school, I would look peek and say, oh, it would be awesome to be one of them. So that's what I tried to do. You know? <laughs> and then you finally, um, then you finally. Get into... Oh, wait, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and, and our, our, the, the, uh, young, we only train to to fight, you know, mm-hmm. to fight. Oh, para pag magyabang, you know. <laughs> that was uh, <laughs> that was our the reason why we trained before, you know, just to be the coolest guys around. But then um, uh, it started getting a little serious, and then um, we started bringing in people from. We brought in Hoyes Gracie. We brought in Kazaka Muniz mm-hmm. in 1998. Pasok ang Labanan. Brought in mm-hmm. Kazaka Muniz one day. And um, really, he was the one who uh, 
opened my eyes into a whole different kind of jiu-jitsu, the sport jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. aspect. Because he was mm-hmm. from Gracie Baja. Boys mm-hmm. Gracie's lineage or his way of teaching is more of the self, self-defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, realistic jiu-jitsu. Well, um, Gracie Baja was more big on the sport, which I only knew when I got introduced to Kazaka. Mm-hmm. And seeing that kind of jiu-jitsu like, blew my mind. Like, wow, there's more to this. And I, yeah. I, I, I know like that much i have that much i knew, i thought i was badass but when i met him i i only knew i knew that, like just just so much of it there's a big sea mm-hmm. of knowledge out there that i didn't know of i wanted mm-hmm. to learn it you know and then and then um go go ahead go ahead and then, cause it, i think um the 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 opportunity with kazeka was was like the narrative is all adding up. Na, na the encounter and meeting Kazeko began the turning point on on when it comes to training, uh, the structure of I mean the structure of training, how preparation was done. So from your perspective, how uh, obvious changes that happened when it comes to preparing you guys for tournaments for your MMA bouts. Well, he taught us how to train properly, like athletic, mm-hmm. like an athlete. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a sport. You have to train. You have to have the mindset of an athlete. Mm-hmm. You can't, um, it's very different from the self-defense where, you know, you just know a cer- certain set of moves to be able to survive and get out of any situation that, you mm-hmm. know, you get caught in. But sport, you know, sport, you're training for someone with the same knowledge, with the same level as you, but now you have to, it, it comes down, you know, to who wants it more, who trained mm-hmm. harder, who had more healthy lifestyle. That's mm-hmm. the difference between the sportive aspect and um, the way I first um, learned Jiu-Jitsu from, you know. And then from there, I don't know, and then of course you can't escape your crazy Kazeka stories because... <laughs> sobrang, sobrang wild si Kazeke, di ba? Pero, pero he, he was able to, to yun na nga yun. I think that is the best, uh, probably the, the mind-shifting part of everything uh, with regards to approaching training, the wealth of knowledge, and yan, parang, parang like a mind-blown moment. Eh. Even si Richard, sabi niya, he thought na Nah, he was already training hard, but then when he met Kazeka and he, Kazeka was able to conduct the training sessions and uh, Alvin allowed him to prepare the guys for tournaments or whoever was going to fight, dun niya nakita yung shift in priorities. Like, uh, exactly, na you have to treat it like an athletic endeavor talaga. Diba? So, from, mm-hmm. fr- from there, eh, from there, so how... How did everything progress now? Like from the guy that was that was just speaking through the window, now you're actually training with the guys that you wanted to train with. Okay, how was that experience? Yeah, I was out of this world. You know, I went to Brazil in 2000. After, um, before then, I was watching. I'd get videotapes. Mario mm-hmm. Scary, uh, Sino Paba, Henzo Gracie, and all yeah. that. Now... Uh, I, I'm there in the same room with maybe 50 of those superstars back then. Mm-hmm. You know, I was starstruck. I was a white belt, and you see Nino Shembri and and these world champions. You know, Peitosa back then, uh, Higan. And wow, you know, you want to be now. Now, my mind shift from being I wanting to be the coolest guy in Makati. Now I wanted to be a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu bro, you know? Mm-hmm. Seeing those guys as a white belt is, wow, now I'm seeing how those guys carry themselves, how they walk around, you know, how people saw them. You, you, you wanted, I wanted to be like that. Like, wow, I want to be a black belt, you know? <laughs> at, that, at that time, it seemed like an impossible goal, mm-hmm. or a long journey ahead. <laughs> but I was... I was um, uh, determined, you know, to reach that level. Mm-hmm. And then from from continuously training, 
and then you shifted to MMA. Uh, anong kumaalale? Like which URCC did you fight? Like the first fight? URCC two. Ultra. Okay. Who was your sino ba kalaba mo nun? The, uh, Bit Torres Taekwondo. Oh, so so from so in URCC two. So you, of course you were you were there in in URCC one. Did, you you were able to see the success of that event. Um, how did the whole like your first MMA match? Like how did it happen? Like how how were you approached about it? Um, who did they tell you? Who were you gonna face? And how were how did you prepare for it? Um, us me uh, doing MMA, uh, competing in MMA for me was a way to promote Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to the Philippine public, you know, to the Philippine mm-hmm. masses. Um, that's the only reason why I stepped in the ring, you know, so mm-hmm. that it would be more mainstream to try to make it mainstream and see, you know, the effectiveness of ground fighting. Mm-hmm. And um, that, and that's how uh, I got into it. I asked, I approached Alvin actually for mm-hmm. a match and that's, yeah, he was able to, um, uh, match me up with the Torres mm-hmm. and we prepared for it like uh, back then the, the more you get beat up the tougher you become that's the mindset back then you know mm-hmm. the, the tougher you are the harder you you know you are to, to beat so we just spent hours and hours trying to beat each other up and that's how yeah that's how <laughs> That's how uh, my first fight, um, preparation for my first fight was just a whole lot of uh, yeah. ass. <laughs> taking, you know, taking how how ass did the beating. fight, how long did the fight last? It lasted maybe uh, maybe two minutes stops, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was nervous. I was nervous. I, you know, being in a ultra with all those people i was nervous i shot it i i think i remember losing a step getting off balance and then i had to go up take him down i mounted him easy and then i punched him once and he gave me a look like what what is this you know mm-hmm. what did i get myself into i looked at uh, the ref i was like i don't think he wants to fight again the ref mm-hmm. is like no go on i punched him again from the mount i was like yeah ref look he doesn't want i got <laughs> off him and that was it Okay. Yeah. Never for and and the preparation was how long, like for that particular fight, Ooh. like how, uh, eight week camp, you know? eight week camp. So it's so that week. So it's about, it's about two months. Yeah, months. Yeah. yeah, like a two month. months. Yeah. yeah, two months. Two months. Never, because it's it's yeah. ane, um, tell most people na, especially the the aspiring MMA fighters that that like a two three month camp. Could either go full three rounds, full five rounds, or just two minutes. So yeah, so you have to prepare for all scenarios. And yeah, this prepare. Camp- we when I prepared, yeah, when I prepared, they, the guys that I had, Rafi Garcia, he was preparing for the fight. Richard, um, Joe, Jerome, who else was? Well, they had Louis, Orlando, Dula. You know, mm-hmm. we were all. Um, I think even Greg, yeah, well, a bunch of us. There's like a whole. I, I have a picture in the dugouts, and there's mm-hmm. like ten of us from Deftac. So it was fun. It was a, a, a more like a party, you know, going in there and anything mm-hmm. else. <laughs> they better, but uh, we would go, push ourselves go. hard, and and at some point, I'd like when I'd break or one of us would break and. Like you, why are we not? We're not even finding someone that tough, and we're like, no, man. You prepare for this with a mindset that you're gonna face Vanderlei Silva or Shogun. That's how you have to prepare. You can't slack off because when you get out there, you know, if you're not prepared, anything can happen. Mm-hmm. And then, like this one, I I asked the same question, Richard. Is like when you got to the venue, how was it like? Like as far as you can recall, like your very first fight, it was the second URCC, the second MMA event in the Philippines. Like, 
going to the venue and once you arrive there what was the atmosphere okay, what was the atmosphere how was how was everyone how was everything and then like like walk us through it um it was exciting the first one of course you always have the butterflies going in it's more of um performance anxiety mm -hmm. stage actors get it you know um at the same time exciting you're there with um a bunch of friends the dugout it was like a, like i said earlier it's more like a party mm -hmm. a big uh, uh like a party of fights and all that it was exciting um uh of course yeah like i said the butterflies but more more of excitement going mm -hmm. into that one particular event that was a good event we had two brazilians in the main event mm -hmm. you know i was i was the fight before that Mm -hmm. I recall, yeah. It was, yeah, it was exciting. And then, of course... Different, different from... No, different from... Different from the, the other fights that we mm -hmm. will talk about later on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the story one is a little bit fun. No, and then, because I feel like the initial, the initial installments of the URCC was exactly like what you said. It was a good introduction ground fighting it was a good introduction for people to have a certain grasp of the concept behind what is brazilian jiu-jitsu and and the art of grappling and even yeah your fight lasted for like two minutes right? more than two minutes so when you won that fight what was was it relief was it excitement like what did you feel right after i didn't feel like um bit uh, you know mm -hmm. two minutes I didn't do much he didn't do anything at all mm -hmm. um I felt the one I won but I didn't feel like you know anything different like okay so this is what it is to win like I didn't feel like I deserved it or I earned I worked for the win mm -hmm. um you had Orlando Dulai having a highlight wheel finish knocking mm -hmm. out Cobra with a spinning he spun in the air and knocked him out. I wanted that kind of finish, you know. I, I, I wanted that kind of excitement from the crowd. Mine was kind of like a boring fight. I was like, I took him down, I punched him once. Out. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I, I felt good. Yeah, a win is always good. But I didn't feel like I worked harder. I didn't, want, I didn't feel like I was able to show what I trained for. Mm -hmm. And then prior yeah. to... And, and a little disappointment. Yeah. And then prior to oh, but prior to that fight, prior to that fight, and after that fight, were you competing in jiu-jitsu tournaments? There, well, I went to 2000, 2002. We went to the mundial. Mm -hmm. I first went with in 2000. It was just me and Kazaka who went to the to the worlds in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And then 2002, I brought Rich. I not Richard. I brought Rafi Pichon. And um, Ericsson, Ericsson and Alvin, we all went to Brazil and we competed in the world and experienced that. Um, how was, the, how then, was the Brazil oh, experience? Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole different story to tell. Do you, how much time do we have here? We have a lot of time, bro. <laughs> we, Don't worry. We have a we, lot of time. We had so much fun over there that um, nowadays, even until this day, you know, when we are together, that's the topic of our conversation, you know, <laughs> our legendary trip. Mm -hmm. We have to top that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't topped that one yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, from, yeah. From, um, like from the, 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 the stories long was that you were able to, um, you only had uh, part of the experience and the main difference between training the Gracie Jiu Jitsu style versus uh, the the eye opening experience that Kazeka gave you, and then you all went to Brazil and you trained there to compete in the Mundials. Like, how was training with how was the training in the Gracie Baja Academy? It was very good. You know, you see everyone there training, same goals as you. You know, very very motivating. You know, mm -hmm. being around guys who have, you know, been there and um, accomplished what you're trying to accomplish and still you see them working hard, hard trying to do more, you know, that, that's what's 
good about Gracie Baja. The, our experience over there. Yeah. And then I think that was the shift from Anone. Uh, I think that's where. Is it? Did you guys? Did we transfer to Gracie Baja before you guys competed the worlds because of Kazeka or no? Duna na na when you guys when you guys uh competed sa Brazil, duna naging Gracie Baja because Kazeka wanted you guys to. Iba Kazeka wanted you guys to represent Gracie Baja, na. Yes, I think um. Before then, uh, maybe a year before, I introduced Alvin and Kazaka. At first, Alvin was hesitant, you mm -hmm. know, to switch. But when I introduced him to the sport of aspect, he also, I, I have, you know, I think, you know, he also, his mindset also changed the way I, my mindset changed when I met Kazaka and got introduced to sport jujitsu. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, like, hey, Alvin, you know, check this out. This is a whole different jujitsu. I went to Brazil, I brought it back, you know, and I introduced Alvin to sporting, sport jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. I showed them, you know, this is Gracie Baja, this is how they compete over there. You know, let's, let's try it out, let's check it out. And after a while, he, was, he said, okay, bring Kazaka in, let's see what he has. And I think um, Alvin also saw, got impressed and said, okay, let's check this out, let's go to Brazil. And... Oh man, we had the time of our lives over there and life changing. I'm sure like like myself, you know, I can I can I can speak for everyone too that our lives like switched you know, after that trip. <laughs> our lives know. switch after that trip. Yeah. Our, 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 it's a life changing experience what we went what we experienced over there. Mm -hmm. And from from the first fight uh, who was your second opponent? In MMA? Oh, was, in uh, MMA now. Hank, Hank, Hank yeah, Lazaro. Richie Lazaro. Na. Richie Lazaro na. Yeah. Okay, so tell us the story. Yeah, for me, say, as, as a, from, from a fan perspective and from a martial artist perspective, like a lot of people just saw that fight as a fight. But for me... And for everyone in the martial arts industry, it was a very pivotal. I mean, I mean, would you and as much as you can tell? And for me, that was a very pivotal fight. That was a very important fight. I say it changed a lot. I mean, believe it or not, okay, everything changed because of one fight. <laughs> I know, right? You know, you know, everything. <laughs> Everything changed because of one fight. So, from the guy who was there, okay, so tell us the story behind that. I, I, I was just an instrument, I think, to, you know, uh, to, to the, uh, instrument now para for that change to happen, mm -hmm. you know. I guess, I guess, um, they chose the two biggest guys in the, Two biggest rival teams. At first, you know, we used to be one club, but mm -hmm. um, we were the northern chapter of Alvin's club mm -hmm. in the south. And then, um, you know how it all starts, like everything else. Ego, whose balls are bigger? My my balls are bigger than yours. And mm -hmm. and um, pretty soon, nagkaingitan or whatever it was. And uh, there's always the human violent, factor there. You know? oh. They got violent and um, you know, and people people got hurt. Mm -hmm. People ended up in the hospital. One guy lost his life, you know, because of this um very petty, petty, you know, petty thing to think about it. Right now, back then, we thought it was the world, you know. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm my I'm bigger than you, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My rep is bigger than you. I'm 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 the baddest guy in Makati, you know, or whatever, we're the baddest club. We rule, you know, it's all about turf and all that, like gang, gang, mm -hmm. gang stuff. And um, that wasn't for me. Um, seeing how I just wanted to train, you know, mm -hmm. I just wanted to train. And I seeing that was like, I already saw, I already been to Brazil, you know, I already experienced how it is to be the, the athlete and, all this jujitsu lifestyle and coming back home and seeing this, you know, 
I didn't want it anymore. I was like, dude, you guys are way behind, you know. Mm-hmm. Here we are um, uh, trying to be bigger than each other just to see who's the toughest guy in the club. And uh, halfway across the world, people are doing bigger, better things. And I was kind of sick with that um, mentality back home. And I was like, dude, I don't. That's, that's, I kind of, my training kind of went down because of that. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, you and people got hurt. And mm-hmm. I, I wanted that change before, uh, before, before 2002. Um, you and people were going out and, uh, uh, fighting in the street, proving mm-hmm. who's better in the street. Yeah. You know? And I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want to be part of that anymore, you know. So um, Hank was part of Pasokuan. I was, I was in that club, and uh, I didn't like how it was turning out. So I was like, hey, you know, I just want to train. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go over there because some um, people in uh, Alvin's club have uh, people that want to train. You know, I had Joey, I had Sean, I had Richard, and these guys, they had no intention of fighting outside in the street you know these guys aren't that type of people Mm -hmm. you know they just wanted to train and i said that's what i want to do i don't want to fight in the street Mm -hmm. um so there and then they just fitted us fitted us together i guess um uh the promoters was like let's put fritz in the biggest guy in deaf back against hank the biggest guy of paso koan and Mm -hmm. let's see let's see how that goes i don't think um the intention of stopping putting an end to street fights was the, was I think that was the intention back then. I think um, uh, it was just who's the better club, but that was the outcome. Of, that was um, a surprising outcome of that fight. Was it opened everyone's eyes in the each team that they you know it's a sport. Why why are we doing this in the street when we have this venue, this uh, this place where we could um, really train and become better, develop ourselves and really see who's the better better fighter mm-hmm. you know and then how then take then same as the first i know like another fight or for the people who, who went there it was it was something that would entertain them but for you and, and especially during that rivalry like how was it now like from the, the difference between your first fight and this one like how different was it like what was the feeling during that night uh, how was the crowd how was the venue were there did they take any precautions or I mean was there what what, what was the atmosphere kumbaga? knowing that there is the, this thing hanging yeah yeah um, the the tension it started way before, way before you, the what the crowd saw that night. You mm-hmm. know what the crowd saw that night. Um, we, for me, Rich Lazaro was this giant of a person that he was actually the one. My second day in Sarian, when I was in in Lasal, Richie showed up and um, he caught me in an arm bar and I was like, "What is that?" You know, I was on top. I was I didn't understand what the guard position was. Mm-hmm. I was on top. I was hitting him. I was trying to hit him, but I couldn't. And then he got me in a reverse arm bar, I remember. And I was like, what is that? How did he get, how did he get me like that? You know? And he invited me to his home and we trained. That's when I started because um, I wanted to train. Um, Sarian was every Wednesday for like yeah. maybe 30, 40 minutes. And I wanted to train more. So he was like, hey, we, we're here in Wak Wak and um, a group of guys are training here and come join us you know so i went over there and that's where i met miles and those guys and from then on i started training you know ground ground fighting stand up and uh richie lazaro always been this guy who was bigger and better and um had more experience than i did so going into that fight i knew that and that was um that was the weight on my shoulders like shoot this guy he's good you know Mm-hmm. I have to train. There's there's some um, there's a uh, pride at stake. There's a lot of um, ego and and um, 
uh, bragging rights. You know, there's a lot. There were, for me at that time, there was a lot at stake. You know, mm-hmm. just not just for me, for my team. Mm-hmm. You know, so I prepared really hard. We we flew in Kazakhstan for that. I stayed at Rizal. We yeah. um. What do you mean you sorry, stayed at Rizal? Sorry, like sorry, okay, so so that you had I, I, better access yeah, to. We, you know? we we hey yes um uh we I rented an apartment and. I think it was Torre Lorenzo somewhere in mm-hmm. front of Rizal Memorial and uh, me and Kazeka only had we had only a bunk bed over there mm-hmm. and that's all we had and we'd wake up every morning run in the track wrestle go back home eat sleep tapos a gabi red corner you know mm-hmm. and that was my life for eight weeks training hard throwing up you know uh, at the point of breaking mm-hmm. giving up and then yeah, and then getting into the fight. When you get into the fight now, you know, you go as you the as some um, you the venue gets closer and closer, your heart starts pounding, you're in the back, um I was focused, you know, trying to block out the crowd. But you can hear, you know, you can hear the crowd. There was no locker rooms back then, so <laughs> my locker room was my car. You could okay. hear, yeah, outside. You could hear the crowd, you know, inside and Knowing that you're the final, that, that's what, you know, that's, you're the one who they came for to watch, added mm-hmm. to the, the, yung kaba, yung intensity, you know. <laughs> they were, the pressure and the drama. Yeah. Um, I remember Mr. Suave was, yung uso pang manta Mr. Okay. Suave. I was outside, someone walked into the, I was with Mr. Suave, and the whole crowd, oh, 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 oh. Um. <laughs> I was like, oh, you got stick to, <laughs> and then, <laughs> You know, the kabado ka sa labas, hearing that, the crowd is there, you know, cheering, yelling. And I just couldn't wait for that fight to get over. I just wanted to get over with, you know. And then, like, tuloy na natin. Like, talk us through, like, what happened during the fight. Um, ooh, that, when I see the fight and I see my pictures, I was like, well, who was that guy? You know, that wasn't me. You know, that... And the stare down, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's like, stare, I, I posted you that one down, time, uh, and people were like, "That's you, Fritz." I, I I can't believe that's you. You know, you're always smiling, and I'm like, yeah, that's not me. <laughs> that was someone else back in there, and um, yeah, I just I just uh, auto, like, autopilot na lang ako, and I just applied what I knew, and mm-hmm. I got the victory. I somehow um, I think I picked him apart. It was a Two ten minute round fight, and mm-hmm. I I think I beat him in the last minute. I just be, I was patient, picked him apart, got position, and then from there on, I was I mounted him, um, threw a couple of punches, and the referee stopped it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anyway, and for, after for, that, I was like, FYI for those who's first time to I mean you sinabi niya kanina the URCC back then adapted a two round. 10 minute rounds. It was a two 10 minute rounds. So the first round and the second round were 10 minutes. So it was a, it was a so alam mo na kagad, if you're fighting in the URCC back then, you were not, you, you were in it for the long haul. 10 minutes is long. Trust me. Damn, damn those days, man. I'm glad <laughs> you guys, these fighters right now don't, don't know how lucky they are. You, you do two 10 minute rounds, these guys, we thought, for two 10 minute rounds, we got to train double. So that's 40 minutes of sparring every freaking day. It's like the sigh of relief when, when, when your CC started adapting to the international, like they're slow, slowly adapting and they're adhering to more, a more internationally based format. Na. Now it's yeah, uh, three five minute rounds, five five minute rounds for title bouts. As in when they announce that, na ito mo nala talaga yung ichuro ng mga fighters no, yung mga fighters kaya hindi ko like. They say yeah, dude, uh, like when when I was helping our teammates for their fights, the shempre ten minute rounds kahit ako. Ten minute rounds. <laughs> Bad trip <to. laughs> Even yeah. us, the sparring partners, were tired. We were exhausted. The the training back then and 
the, the mindset and training back then is really different from the way I coach my fighters now. Now it's more of a scientific kind of approach, you know. Mm -hmm. Back then, you know, Bubuga, the, the more you get beat up, the tough you are. Now, um, you don't have to kick the banana tree, you know, mm -hmm. to, to achieve the same results. You can get the same in the banana bag without mm -hmm. uh, busting your shins and getting the same results, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's the difference between then and now. Now it's more of a scientific. You don't have to get your ass beat in training constantly to be able to be successful in the fight. Mm -hmm. And then from, from <laughs> <laughs> you, sabi ko, sabi ko, whenever I share stories with my students and like the, the new teammates, I go like, the training back then was like, you watch the Spartans train or you have a glimpse of how Spartans train, that was it. <laughs> it's like, it was, it was a yeah, battle of uh, you know, like, matira matibay. And then. Yeah, you think like, you're going to be fighting lions in yeah. the Coliseum with the way we train, man. Mm -hmm. Then I go like especially yeah, sa sa ano. Ano. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, so I go. Drag me. Kinahata ko, nakahiga ako, kinahata ko from sa paa. Mm -hmm. Balik ka sa ring. Ayo ko na. <laughs> Ay, tama na. <laughs> bukas na, bukas na. And and there, so so from there, let's go back to the training camps. How were the training camps? Like how was Alvin as a coach back then? Like when you when he was yeah, the one conducting yeah. training. Get it along, okay? I'll 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 tell you this one story mm -hmm. of one fight. Let's go past Richie Lazarus fight and my fight now. Yeah, is let's again. Yeah, let's let's you go. Know, let's go the beyond the Richie Lazarus fight. Okay. Okay. Um, I was supposed to fight Ao Hai Lin, mm -hmm. guy from China. I was my had my mindset to fight that guy. I went back to the states and trained with Kazaka and same thing. You know, came back. Um, found out that the fight was um, scrapped, the, the, the match was scrapped, and I'm fighting this young kid from Guam. I was like, I know, dude, I don't want to fight that guy. I see his videos, he was like 7 and 0. You know, I haven't fought in two years. They had to fight, they had to find, um, because of the Richie fight, I don't know, for some reason, I couldn't fight local matchups. They didn't want to mm -hmm. fight me, you mm -hmm. know. So we had to look elsewhere, and I wanted, I wanted the uh, after seeing the guy from China, I think I could have had a good fight with him. So I, mm -hmm. I asked them to match me up with him, but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, they matched me with Frank the Crank. I was like, I don't know. I don't know about that guy. I don't, I don't have any motivation to fight this guy. They were like, no, 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 you got this. So I trained. Um, I went to Red Corner and Intercon every night to train. Okay. And, um, I got I got pushed hard. I got pushed hard the same same way. But uh one 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 good story is I you know how Alvin is with his time, yeah, you know. Yeah. There's Filipino time and there's, there's, there's Filipino there's time plus and then there's Alvin Aguilar time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one day I was there at Red Corner. I heard Alvin was gonna be late. So I was like, dude, it's seven o'clock, let's get on with this. Sport forty forty minute round, you mm -hmm. know, forty minute round. I did well. I remember that day I was so, so motivated to spar. I was like, let's get this training done. And then after the 40 minutes, training was done. I was like, relieved. I, I felt like my, my training night was good. My perform, I performed good. I see in the pool area, I was, red corner, the ring was outside. I see yes, in the outside. Yeah, outside. Yeah. Alvin standing there. Alvin standing there. He's like, threats. Wow, you know. He, he liked what he saw that day, you know. Mm -hmm. Like that's how you train. That's how you train. And then he, after that, he's like, "Okay, let's go train some more." So after that, <laughs> I was like, "I was ten o'clock at night, ten thirty, and I had to go through another forty minute training." <laughs> you know, that's like, "Nah, I'll be in the van." You know, parang, parang, you know, I don't know that camp. <laughs> that camp was something else. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, that was a harder camp than um, Richie Lazaro because uh, first off, um, we train late nights. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no structure and yeah, patayan, patayan, patayan system, you know. Oh, patayan like, you system. Know, yeah. Well, I didn't have, I didn't have time to recover because the next day, ganyan naman, you know. 
I came to, I went in that fight, beat up, you know, beat up. Uh, not, uh, parang, wala, wala ako sa laban nun. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't want to be there. Mm-hmm. And this I was goes... Just, I was just um, conditioning my mind that I have to fight and I'm, I'm there, and there's a fight. Really, my heart was in there. Yeah. And and this goes to show how important. Like now, it's a clear indication of of that, it, that fighting is not just about the physical preparation. It's a lot. Uh, there's there's the mental aspect of training. There's the emotional aspect of training. I mean, if you're just training but your heart's not in it or your attention isn't there, it will translate come fight night, deba. Right? Yeah, yeah. But I think it's more. 80 percent they say mental is 80 percent yeah mm-hmm. it's during camp 100 yeah yeah i think it's 100 percent mental for me because you have to be 100 percent there you know to train for a fight mm-hmm. you know now it's more like i said earlier now it's a more scientific approach so i i'm glad i did these four how many fights did i do four fights in the urcc Mm-hmm. Okay, um it made me it taught me the mental aspect the mental aspect of the game you know what the fighter goes through you know what he's thinking mm-hmm. during the camp mm-hmm. you know when you're at home you know it's a lot it's a lot you have to be 100 percent all throughout the camp and the house in the gym in the in the ring in the cage you know it all it all has it all is mental. So mm-hmm. I'm glad I did those four fights. Now I I learned the mental aspect and what how to see if a fighter is burned out, if he mm-hmm. if he needs more training, you know, what he needs, you know, to be one hundred percent when it comes to fight day. And then from Cinema, so after after Richie it was Hank Hank the Crank. Tama, right? Hank the Crank. Crank, the crank, the crank, the crank. Oh, crank, the crank. Crank, the yeah. crank. Yeah, he's from, I think he, alam ko taga Lloyd Irvin yung nagwahan eh. Yeah, he's from Guam. Alam ko nag Lloyd Irvin. He, yun, he's eh. from Saipan and now he fights in the UFC. You mm-hmm. know, you see, if you see his fights in the UFC, like, dang, <laughs> badass. Yeah. Very conditioned guy. Alam ko si, si, si Frank, yeah. you know, one of the yeah. more conditioned he, guys. He loves to fight, you know. Mm-hmm. He loves to fight, and and then after that, guys, you know, who was your, who did you uh, fight next? Razi Jabari. Razi, Razi Jabari. Jabari. Okay. Yes. Me- medyo. That was um, <laughs> the year after Frank the Crank. Uh-huh. Razi Jabari. Hey, I, it's a huge, it's a huge guy. Me. Yeah, from Ir- Iranian, mm-hmm. Iranian guy who came. Yeah, so I, I asked Alvin to match me up, you know, see see if I could uh, overcome the loss, you know, to pick myself up and uh, see how I do. I was mm-hmm. like, if I win this fight, this is going to be my last fight. If I lost, I maybe I'd, I'd still get a few more. But I was going to, yeah. I was like, after this, if I win, I already know how it is to um, overcome a loss. Mm-hmm. And I know what to do when it comes to coaching because all of this really like I said in the start is just to promote the sport of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and mixed martial arts just to let people know that it's there it's, it's arrived in the Philippines and it's available and really I did all this fighting just to get knowledge just to gain knowledge so that I can pass it on to someone who wants to do that mm-hmm. you know I didn't I didn't see myself going uh, that taking that career of a professional mixed martial artist, you know, I didn't, I didn't see myself living that life, but I knew I was going to teach from the mm-hmm. start, you know? Okay. And then after Razi, Razi, was Razi the last fight or may isa ka pa ba? He was the last fight. He was the last fight. That was the last fight mm-hmm. after that. And then you switched. the gloves and... How was the switch now? How was the switch now from being the student who was receiving instruction to coaching, like the first years of coaching? Well, um, I always had uh, I always had a passion for, for teaching. 
ching and ching. Even during the time I was fighting and competing in MMA, I built my gym, the Deftac Edsa, mm -hmm. uh, and I was teaching and training students, training students, um, and inter you know I introduced the jiu-jitsu lifestyle to to the northern side of Metro Manila, and I had. I really, I, you know. That was a that, classic that chapter. Yeah, so that a classic, classic chapter. And classic chapter. It's built this, you know. Now, now my, like, Tofi and Raymond, they're there doing big things, you know, building this, mm -hmm. building the, you know, keeping that legacy alive, you know. So, yeah. So, um, uh, teaching now, you know, I, like, I, it's always been a, passion for me i love to teach I, I i love what i do you know and um it came natural i i get natural for me you know to be able to pass it down mm -hmm. and then the process of making the decision of opening up your own academy because here's the thing is everybody can say nah nah i want to teach i want to teach i want to do this i want to be a coach but you, you it's like you took it several steps further you you decided na once you get there you decided na this is for you and then you built your own academy like how was that process like how was that process like the challenges that you faced and what were the problems along the way well um you have to do it for the love of it you know you mm -hmm. that that's that's it if you if you do it with the intention of to make money mm -hmm. I don't think you're getting into it for the right reasons you know because you have to, to have a passion for it you have to um, uh, yeah you just have to have a love for it so that when you fail you know because you will fail until now you know up to this day I'm so I'm still falling you know and when it comes to building these gyms you know, especially now COVID nineteen. You know, all the gyms are closed. That's another challenge that I'm mean, we're facing in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, you just have to have a passion. You just have to love what you do and enjoy it. You know, because there are times that uh, ah, mahirap talaga, mahirap talaga yung, uh, yung, the martial arts business is not as easy as it seems. Or you know, mm -hmm. you can oh, let's, let's open up a gym. You don't know the the business side of mm -hmm. it, it's not that easy you know student retention gym management fighter trying to trying to um build fighters at the same time you know and um for someone who doesn't love or isn't passionate about it it's easy to drop it and hang in hang the you know hang up your gloves as soon as the first uh sign of uh, distress comes in, you know, mm. if you don't love it, it's like, ah, I don't need to, let me, let me do something else. But yeah, you have to have the love and the passion for it to be able to um, uh, stay in this kind of business, this kind of lifestyle, you know, it's not easy. <laughs> from there, is it, when I see, when I see that one of the, and one of the, like, to be honest, one of the more motivating things for me, like, I'm teaching now, and then every time I, I get in a rut, I, I, I don't know how, I think getting in a rut is probably, for the lack of a better term, like, when I'm in a rut and I always ask myself na, na ano ba tong, sometimes there are days, I, I don't know if you get them, but there are days that I, I tend to question myself na, the why am I doing this? Or is up to hanggang saan ko ba to kayang dalen? And then it brings me comfort to see my friends. And yeah, I see photos of your gym. I see photos of our friends' gyms. Na yan sila sila Savior, sila Chris, and all the other gyms that are making it happen. And I, I that is my source of motivation. Na parang I see the happy people, and then I. I tend to look back and look at my own class photos and then it, it gives me a good sense of perspective na parang, okay, this is why I'm doing this. This is like how important is 
the sense of community when it comes to the survival of a gym. Yes, and we're all in the same. Funny you mentioned because you see us and we're all the same. And we, <laughs> we all have those times when we question ourselves and have doubt and you know, especially me, I have three kids and you know, family, like will this bring um uh will this be able to sustain them? You know, you always think of that. You know, in the future we'll be able to give them the same life that I experience, you know, all that. But being a dad and it all it all plays uh, plays with your mind. You know, mm-hmm. and there are a lot of times that, you know, when things aren't going your way that you like, you know, it's, it's so easy to quit. But like I said, because we love what we do, we stick around. We may not love it every day. You know, we may not like what's happening, happening to us every day. But since we love what we're doing, that's what keeps us around, you know. Especially now, it's like. Gyms are closed. Especially now, yeah. <laughs> no, like, you don't and, know. You don't know what um, what's the new normal, as they mm-hmm. say. What's going to happen when do, gyms do open? Mm-hmm. I see videos now of uh, jujitsu gyms, like in Texas, like Jacolino. They have uh, taped off uh, areas mm-hmm. so that you're six feet distance. You're in a six feet radius distance from the other guy, and then um. You have a grappling dummy, you know, and mm-hmm. that's just a, uh, um, you know, panakibutas uh, or something like that. I don't know mm-hmm. the right term for it. I can't think of the right term right now. It's just a means, you know, to get back to it. But that's not what jujitsu is, you know. It's jujitsu's contact. We need yeah. to roll, you know. So it's scary this time that how long this is gonna last, you know. Mm-hmm. That's what's but i am sure that's what's trouble troubling every gym owner every teacher right now but um because we love what we do you know we're gonna stick it out and i think because of that everything will be okay mm-hmm. totally agree because yeah. it dito, i mean people are just waiting for the go signal and that's it's, it it's yeah. it's it's, it's eh, parang, i think everyone is just waiting for the for for that para pag sinabi ni government okay guys back to normal everyone's itching to go back to yeah. training i said uh, we we get that and it's very comforting to be honest it's very comforting to know that uh the community that we've built is very supportive and at the same time well that, that's the consensus like everyone's everyone's very keen on getting back to training and 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 ito lang din yun eh. like in the jiu-jitsu community I, I don't know what is the what what's the news there ang pinaka pinaka obvious si Jacare pero like for example us here in the Philippines like MMA and jiu-jitsu community like there's no there's no who I know there's no there's no case <laughs> I, don't know, I think we've only heard there's of no one there's no case exactly yeah, yeah like Hodger and Jacare now mm. that's the only thing I heard, heard of you know? There are people here down uh, in some gyms here. They started rolling, you know. I don't mm. know how that goes. <laughs> and then we'll I see, see. Yeah, no, I see, I see a lot of, I see a lot of garage jujitsu going on there. Yeah, I see <laughs> but, a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's about um, and they, cause it, it, the mm. best way to boost your immune system is is to exercise, you know, <laughs> and to beat to beat any kind of virus is to is to boost your immune system. So for you to do that, you have to exercise. Ano lang talaga eh. Um, uh, it's it's really who you are with, and who are those people with. I say yun yung nagiging. I think that is the main concern. Is you could be asymptomatic and you could pass it on to someone else. Pero yun nga if your body's strong and you can fight it, di ba? I don't know. <laughs> we don't know anymore. We don't know anymore. Diba? So at least yeah, the end. So... And, and, and not now you're not just teaching jiu-jitsu classes. You're also handling MMA fighters. So where do you strike the balance? How do you how do you do your best to manage everything? Like how many classes? And then do you prioritize time if someone's fighting? 
yeah um uh i i teach my kids i teach they're all competitive you know my mm-hmm. kids they they compete a lot like mm-hmm. once a month at least and then i have my jiu jitsu class i have my private classes and then i have the mma the mm-hmm. mma and uh, Amico, i saw a lot of mma fighters coming from your gym now yeah, we have a few and uh it, it's not hard to balance because you know I, I i always have something in store for these mma guards mm-hmm. you know i know i i i see them every day so i know pretty much what they need what they need to work on you know it's it's not also as easy as some um, people think Mm-hmm. Uh, finding matching fights is hard, you know. Mm. It, yeah, it's it's even here. You think ah, damn it, then the states na there's a lot of athletes. It's a deep pool. No match, matching these fighters stuff is hard. Mm-hmm. There are fights that fall out. Maybe if you have you see a guy fighting twice a year, three mm-hmm. times a year, you know, it's where right they end. Um, ah, talaga? Wow. My fighters, yeah, my fighters, my fighters, they have fights, more fights falling out than they do have fights, you know? It's crazy. And then are these like professional fighters that fighting is what they do? Professional or? fights, Bellator. Okay. We have, uh, there's Bellator. Um, I have fighters that fought the UFC, Bellator, and now um, Comte Americas, which is like the 1FC of uh, South America. You know, mm-hmm. one parang one FC is to Asia, Combate Americas, dito sa Latin America and crowd. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what uh, my fighters have been. Um, the promotion that we've been uh, uh, active in. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah. medyo curious ako dito. Like, since they're fighting professionally, do they do something else, or are they really concentrated on just fighting? They're concentrated on just fighting. You know, well, I have. One fighter, Gio, he's a professional dog groomer. Mm-hmm. So while he's not on the side, he does that. But um, yeah, these guys are dedicated fighters and 100% gym so, rats. So, so like, along, along, so, so from there, it's everyday training. So during the, if they don't have fights, they, they focus more on what? Like skill building or they, do they do drilling? Skill building, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, drilling. Some of them teach mm-hmm. their coaches and um, wrestling coach. You know, they have, uh, uh, they teach, they work for the high schools, you know, mm-hmm. wrestling coaches. So, so then, then afterwards, you know, when, season, they just try to stay in shape. Mm-hmm. And then when they get to, like, for example, they get, they get to fight in, in any organization. Where do you start preparing? Like once the contract is signed or once they just get a notice? Uh, they, they train every day, mm-hmm. regardless of a uh, uh, match or not. You know, just to stay in shape, just to learn more, get more knowledge. And then um, when the fight is set, meaning contract is signed, the match mm-hmm. is set, then we start training more specifically for that certain fighter, mm-hmm. you know, looking for holes, looking for ways to be strategy to beat that certain fighter, you know, mm-hmm. that's when camp starts really. But before then it's very, you know, it's very generalized training, you know, just um, getting better at what they're good at and improving their weaknesses. Mm-hmm. You know, how it is. <laughs> and then from, from, so yeah, let I, I want to, I, I Naalala, naalala ko na tanong na to. I've always uh, a guy that has the perspective who has a better perspective of the jiu-jitsu scene in the Philippines and then the jiu-jitsu scene there in the United States. Like in terms of relevance and acceptance to student count, like how far are they? Um I'm very impressed of what jiu-jitsu has become in the Philippines, you know. There are guys that are coming out of there with uh, vast knowledge. You guys are bringing people in from over here from brazil you know you guys are actually um uh have more uh are learning more from sources that than i am over here you know mm-hmm. you know i have these guys they're all you see these guys that you guys bring in their their gyms are not too far away from 
my my town but um you guys are, are more involved with these guys than I am <laughs> you know so I see you guys have uh every month uh people from going over there mm-hmm. you know and conducting seminars with you guys which is um which is good you but know, which is good but- I don't get to do that much yeah, but based here. on, but based on student count and like, cause if for example, I, how how do I phrase this? Like for example, when I have a conversation with Reese, parang it's one of the things na na like it's one of the things that I think about most of the time. I go like, a lot of people want to defend themselves. A lot of people see the relevance of self defense, but how come they don't want to train self defense, diba? It's like, and mm-hmm. and for me, and as much as I want to promote jujitsu, and you want to be a good vessel for jujitsu, you want to spread awareness. And I always see, I'm very happy to see na, yeah, for example, in Australia and gents, America, and dami na jujitsu. So it gives me the motivation na, the, like for example, of a mat full of students is possible here as well, diba? So, yung yung in terms of of acceptance. And and awareness, siguro. Like, is it is it the same or must aware of mga tao dyan? I think it's it's getting to be at the same um, level of uh, acceptance and all that. I think mm-hmm. the Philippines has grown a lot over the past years. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just that the more accessibility to training, I guess, is the difference. Here, there's Less some um, distraction, I think. You know, if you really want to focus on something, it's more possible than it is compared to Metro. Well, let's say Metro Manila in particular. You know, there's a lot of distractions. You know, mm. it's a traffic palang. You go to the gym, like a uh, hassle. You know, that's the only thing I see as a hindrance, which is the distractions and the, also the discipline. You know, I I'm just speaking for myself. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. When it comes to you know. I don't know how it is, or guys, where they're really motivated guys, but um, mostly it's based, it falls down to discipline and how bad you want, uh, how good you want to become, how bad you want it, you know. Yeah, that's yeah, but, it. Because, because there's a lot of distractions. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you don't have that here, you know, you don't have that here. So, if you really want to focus, on something it's easier to do mm-hmm. and tagal na pala na. <laughs> okay let's wrap this up professor Fritz Rodriguez thank you so uh, much for it, doing it, this <laughs> <laughs> how long how long how, what time is it I, I don't know man it's more than an hour and so I barely scratch uh, the surface I want I want to do more I, this is this is what I told Fritz uh, before anytime, I go man, like anytime. I go like I want to segment all these episodes, I don't want to cram up in, in I want to cram it up in one episode that we're going to rush it. So, I mean, uh, I want to cut it off there so that at least we get to segmentize everything. And, and I, wa- I want to talk more about certain things probably for another episode. But um, thank you for being here, man. Thank you. Appreciate you it's, guesting on the podcast. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Uh, where can people yeah, find my you? Pleasure. Where, where can people find you, your social media and your school? Please plug it here. Um, Instagram, Fritz Rodriguez MMA. Mm-hmm. Uh, just look for me, Fritz Rodriguez on Facebook. And then um, I have my gym here in Palmdale, California, SoCal Fight Factory, SoCal Fight Factory Palm. And in the Philippines, uh, Fight Factory Manila, mm-hmm. you know, you can find us we're everywhere there, you know. Yeah. So, hey. yeah, it was very honor and pleasure to be part of your uh zoom podcast and mm-hmm. i can't wait till the next time and you see uh, we're just barely scratching the surface barely we scratching can, we, the surface we man. can fun we could go all day you know <laughs> stories like what's good about um death tax is uh we have a good history and yes. stories and and th- i think that's the main that. reason why i wanted to do this i wanted to more or less like give the stories that we can tell <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good it's a good basis and a good uh, it's a good base point for good base point for future students so 
Fritz Rodriguez MMA, so called Fight Factory, and Fight Factory, Man- uh, Fight Factory Manila. Manila. Yep, they're they're all over the place. Uh, very good gyms, and um, the the students that he mentioned, yeah, and see Professor Tofi Lagan, he's carrying on the legacy by uh, by a project lifestyle Manila. So, uh, Prof, thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing this. And with that, thank you that's, so much, Prof. Yeah, that's what yeah. Coach Franco says. Bye bye. Coach Franco says, we'd like to thank our partners for making this episode possible. The faceless emotion as your senses come together. Being in the moment is the only thing that matters. Knots and crosses. Place your orders on their Facebook and Instagram pages. Delicious beans for your daily brew? Get your fix now with Awan Coffee. Order now on their Facebook and Instagram pages. Spelled A-W-O-N Coffee. Gatorade. Because nothing beats Gatorade. Inspiring community and culture. Spread the good vibes in the local jiu-jitsu community. Visit Ikiro Collective at ikiro.ph. Read news about the local martial arts scene here in the Philippines. Visit Local MMA on Facebook. And listen to one of my favorite podcasts, Destroy MNL. The insights and lessons people share in my channel are inspirational, motivational, and life-changing. They have to be shared to help others achieve their dreams. My life is about providing value and helping others achieve their goals. Please help me make more podcast episodes, video tutorials, and educational content that will benefit everybody. Support this channel by clicking the link in the description box. Thank you for your support and I will keep making content that matters. So that's it everyone. Hope you enjoyed. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye.